Hi everybody, welcome back. We've got a lot of material to cover today. Uh, today's video I'm calling Seven Steps to Union with God. And the subject is going to be basically reviewing the stages of union with God that St. Teresa of Avila um, explains in her book, Interior Castle. And she's got, you know, from step one to step seven, where step seven is what she calls mystical union with God or mystical marriage. I'd like to walk through what all of those are so that we can be more fami familiar with them and can start to try to practice them ourselves. One of the things that I really appreciate about St. Teresa of Avila and her works is she usually will start out um, saying something to the effect of everything that she speaks of is either something that she knows from personal experience or that she knows because she's personally spoken with someone with personal experience with what she is describing. And so that's kind of the approach I would like to take today with this topic. I'm not so much setting out to summarize St. Teresa of Avila's works so much as apply my personal experience to this outline that she's created of the seven steps to union with God. Um, so I'll kind of go through each step and explain what my experience was. And, you know, I don't have personal experience with all the steps, but, you know, I, I feel like that is an engaging way to explain what I know so that it makes sense to other people because it can be, someone gave me the word ineffable. It's very difficult to describe exactly what these experiences are like, so it's helpful to have this kind of outline to follow. I will next week be doing a video about somewhat of the same topic, but from the perspective of John of the Cross, they have a little bit of different emphases on the subject, and so if there's anything that you guys want more information about or detail on, um, let me know in the comments, and I can always tag that on to next week's talk. Um, because there are going to be some different points that I emphasize more in that one than I do in this video today. Um, so, kind of an interesting introduction to this topic would be, I noticed a lot of Christian art, Catholic art, old art, depicting great saints in a very unique theme that I am noticing. Um, and I'm going to put up a couple works that depict what I'm trying to describe here. So you look at these images, which we see fairly frequently with the great saints of the church, and I'm kind of surprised that I've never wondered before, what is that a picture of? What? I mean, it's a theme. It seems that these great saints are very often depicted this way, but I don't understand what that is a picture of. And so as we start to look at this process of mystical union, I think what those images are depicting starts to make a lot more sense. So let's get into it. Um, St. Teresa of Avila in her seven steps. Uh, she has them broken down into a couple categories. So the first three steps she considers active. Um, so in the first three stages, it's the individual willfully trying to accomplish something. Um, so it's something that we have control over. And then the final four steps, steps four through seven, they aren't something we can accomplish as an act of our will. It's more something God does to you than something that you do. Um, you could say it's more of a grace than something that you can learn. But you can't, you, you don't really have a lot of hope to getting to those latter stages without putting the work in, in the first three stages. Um, so before you even get into step one, you have to, maybe this sounds obvious, you have to decide to start. So what does that mean? That means basically a conversion of heart. You decide to turn away from your sin. You go to confession. 
You receive the sacraments. You get yourself back in God's grace. When we sin, we are effectively telling God that we don't want to be in relationship with him and that we are not prioritizing him first in our lives, that we're choosing something else to prioritize over him. And when we do that, it's a pretty powerful way to say, I don't want what you have to offer. And God's not going to give you mystical union with him if you are denying what he asks of you. So step one is you have to decide you want to be in union with God. And so that means turning away from your sins and getting into a state of grace. So then we enter into step one. Step one is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It is just learning how to pray. So probably if you hadn't up to this point decided to start on this process, I'm going to guess you hadn't been praying. Um, so you have to learn at some point. And so for me, um, I actually went through my reversion to the faith only a little over about two years ago. So one of my embarrassing things, I have to admit, is when I reverted, I was a cradle Catholic, but fell away. And when I came back, um, very quickly realized I didn't know how to pray the rosary. So what I did, I just got on YouTube and on my drive to and home work, I would play the rosary on YouTube and pray along with it. And it took me a couple months before I was comfortable praying it alone um, without having the recording playing. So that was kind of one of the big ways that I taught myself how to pray. Um, this is also a time to do a lot of self-reflection just, you know, coming back into the faith, starting to pray, thinking about, okay, hopefully I've managed to rid myself of these mortal and serious sins that take me out of God's grace. But what are some ways that I'm sinning venially? What are some other ways I'm falling short or ways that I can grow in virtue? Um, so that's kind of step one. It's pretty basic. Uh, it's kind of just getting your feet wet in the Christian life and learning these new habits that are going to bring you closer to God. Um, so then that brings us to step two. So step two would be persevering in prayer and trying to increase in holiness. And um, from my perspective, just immersing yourself in the faith and learning more about it, surrounding yourself with good people, edifying materials. Um, so at this stage of my life, I was still learning a lot about the faith, doing a lot of reading, listening to a lot of Catholic YouTube talks, um, making sure I was surrounding myself with holy people, having conversations about holy things. Um, it's also a time to maybe learn more about the virtues and maybe start reading some saints and seeing how they live their lives and take a step to consider how am I living my life? And it's probably different from how the saints are living their lives. And so what are little things that I can start to change about myself in order to you know, get one step closer every day to that goal? Um, there are two types of prayer that you can be practicing in this second stage. There's meditation and then there's contemplative prayer or mental prayer. Um, so meditation would be, you know, doing your rosary, which is classic Catholic prayer. Um, but in the rosary, you do each decade meditating on one of the mysteries, which is a scene from the Gospels. So it's basically... Um, just having that time to mentally place yourself into the mysteries of Christianity and just imagine that playing out. Um, whereas the second type of prayer, contemplative prayer, is really just sitting in silence, focusing on God. There's not so much activity going on in contemplative prayer as there is in mental prayer. And I remember at this stage, personally, um, you know, I was getting into the habit of praying the rosary every day. And I went to confession with my priest and he advised me to try to start to practice this contemplative prayer. And what he advised was, he said, start with two minutes. So try for two minutes, set the timer on your phone to just sit and try to think of nothing but God. 
and see if for two whole minutes you cannot have any distractions and just be completely focused. And then he said, every day, add a minute. I can't say in all honesty that I practice that perfectly and did that every day, but it was definitely something after talking with him that I made a real effort to generally start to practice, um, particularly going to adoration and, you know, maybe you do a chaplet or a rosary, but then just sitting and having that time, I, I would describe it as sitting in nothingness almost, um, but just pure focus on God, which definitely takes practice. It does not come naturally. We're so easily distracted. So it's a skill you have to develop through work and practice. Um, so that's basically step two. You know, you're starting to become just more aware of yourself. If you fall into sin, you catch yourself and you get yourself back to confession and you are just making a real effort to try to grow in holiness, increase the time you're spending in prayer and just generally increase your focus on God each day. Um, so then we get to step three, which is the last of the active steps. Um, and basically it's kind of a continuation of the first two. That's all just a progression. And so you'll notice when you get to step three that you start to have this pretty notable desire to do anything you can to avoid offending God. So you're past the point of really struggling with mortal sin. It's often more tinier things that probably to the average person that they would think is no big deal. Um, but you're starting to take note, particularly if you spent time reading the saints and you see kind of their attitude and perspective, you start to realize like, oh, I was, I was a little impatient with that person. I was, I was selfish when I did this. I, you know, these, these smaller things that are maybe less obvious to other people than they are to ourselves if we're really paying attention. Um, because only we really know our intentions and why we do things. And so the more reflection we have on ourselves and self-awareness we acquire, the more we can start to see these things acting in ourselves. And so in this stage, you really almost have this emotional reaction to doing anything small that would hurt God. It kind of hurts you because you're growing in love for God. So the last thing you would ever want to do is offend him. Um, so that's something I noticed in this stage is just that aversion that I felt. Um, so yeah, you're again, increasing your time in prayer, probably by stage three, you're definitely spending more than an hour a day in prayer. Um, I think Teresa of Avila says hours, that's pretty open-ended, but I would say more than an hour for sure. Um, at this point there, one thing that, that Teresa notes is when you're in stage three, you haven't fully surrendered your will to God. Um, and so that's something to take note of because there's a big jump between stage three and stage four, and that is part of it. Um, and then in stage three, when you're really putting a lot of effort and you're getting pretty practiced in prayer and meditation and co contemplation, you'll, you'll have some sense of spiritual satisfaction. It's not anything mystical. It's just kind of like a sense of peace and love and joy um, from that experience. But God will also give you periods of aridity where you don't get anything back for what you're putting in. And Teresa explains that these times are basically God testing your perseverance and love. Like, do you really want this? And um, so when you hit that wall and you know what you say, it's been a month and you know, I'm praying and I'm praying and I don't, it feels empty. That's normal. And you just push through it because it's not about you and it's none of this is about anything you're trying to seek. It's about seeking God and love. 
and through the stages you increase in love and so even if you're not getting anything back from your prayer experience you keep pushing through so then we get to step four and this is a big boundary this is that line between active prayer which is things you can practice and passive prayer which is God acting on you and some pretty crazy things happen so one of the moments that I remember really distinctly and was probably one of the first times that I remember having kind of a strange experience um, was actually during the COVID lockdowns this past spring. Um, there was a, an evening and I don't remember exactly what brought it on. I just remember finally getting to that point where I was praying. I said, okay, God, take it. You know what? I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I let go of myself, Will. And I had a pretty, at that time I had never experienced anything like this, but it, I felt what I can best describe as like a burning sensation in my chest. Didn't seem to me like a medical problem. I still to this day don't think it's a medical problem. Um, it feels like a spiritual fire, a spiritual burning. Um, so that kind of plays into some of the experiences that are had in this fourth stage. Um, so there are two types of supernatural prayer that are experienced in the fourth stage. Um, the first Teresa of Avila describes as the prayer of quiet. Um, the way I could best describe this, and again, this is based on my personal experience, so I don't know if everyone has had this experience, but I'm going to assume this is a pretty common experience for people. So when you are falling asleep at night and maybe it's taking you a little bit longer than normal to fall asleep and you get into that kind of half conscious stage where you almost get down to a single line of consciousness and you're not thinking about everything going on around you. It's kind of like the world is shut out a little bit, but you still have a stream of consciousness, but it's focused on the one thing that you're thinking about. Um, that's probably the best comparison that I have for what prayer of quiet is. Um, so when you experience prayer of quiet in as compared to the previous three steps where you are having to really actively put all of your energy in, into focusing on God and to swatting away all of the distractions as you're trying to pray, when you get into prayer of quiet, um, you're definitely awake. So that's something at times I felt it was easy to confuse. Am I having prayer of quiet or am I just falling asleep? Um, so, you know, particularly in the times when I know I'm not tired, much more confident that this is what is happening. Um, but you go in, when you go into prayer, it's all, everything sensory and all of the extra thoughts that would normally bombard you in your daily life. It's like they're suddenly separated from you. Um, you're still very much conscious. You're very much aware of your surroundings, but all of these extra things aren't coming in and you almost get down to like that single line of consciousness where I know I can sit for like 45 minutes, an hour when this happens to me um, and sit and pray rosaries, um, you know, go a couple times around and not once be distracted, just be so in the zone. And it's not a matter of any type of effort. It's just like everything else has faded away. I'm still aware of it because that's distinctive from the fifth step, but um, it's not impacting me at all. And so that's the best way that I would describe the prayer of quiet. Um, and then the second type of supernatural prayer that's experienced in the fourth step um, is called passive recollection. And this, I think it goes more along with my experience of having that burning sensation in my chest. Um, so St. Teresa 
describes passive recollection basically as um, it's like you're a turtle retreating back into your shell. So also in this um, type of prayer, this passive recollection, you are still totally aware of everything that's going on around you, but you have this desire to step away from it. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, so like the passive, or sorry, the prayer of quiet will often happen when I'm doing my rosaries, um, which is, you know, a type of verbal prayer and meditation. However, when this passive recollection strikes, I actually have an aversion to engaging in verbal prayer. Um, so the best way that I would describe it is generally it's some degree of this type of burning sensation in my chest, but I also describe it as the feeling that God is sitting with me. And it's really hard to describe it in another way. It's not like he's sitting next to me, but like he's sitting in my soul. And there are times where this is just a very gentle awareness where it feels less like that burning, but still that presence. And then there are times where I feel my chest is burning so much that it almost hurts. In fact, probably the first time it burned to more of an extreme, I was in mass. And when it was happening, I just immediately without thinking about it, prayed to God and said, how am I supposed to be able to handle this? And I felt like I immediately heard him tell me back um, that he would prepare me for it, which was very consoling because I was literally sitting there thinking, this is almost too much. Like it almost hurts, but it's good at the same time. It's like you want it there, but it's a lot. Um, there was one day I was um, at my family's lake house and I felt that more gentle presence, just that God came to sit in my soul, but it was there for hours. Oftentimes when it's more intense, it's there for maybe 10, 15 minutes, maybe five minutes. This was with me for hours. And even though I was around a lot of people and there were activities going on, um, I, I had no desire to engage in them. It's like I wanted to retreat and not pay attention to anything other than God sitting in my soul. Um, it's probably the best way I have to describe it. So yeah, I would say what's notable when this happens, like I said, there's an aversion to verbal prayer because there's this feeling that if you were to start to engage in verbal prayer and just rattling things off that somehow you would like lose this feeling like that God's presence would fall out of your grasp and so this is more like this is kind of from the limits of my experience it's like the perfect state to be in in adoration where if it hits you in adoration you are literally just sitting there adoring and there's nothing else going on you are pulled away from everything else around you and you are just so honed in on the Eucharist and you know, occasionally there'll be a, um, like an, oh, my adorable Jesus or, you know, glory be, but it's not me sitting there um, actively saying prayers. It would, it's more, I would describe it, when you're in this state, your prayer is just, a will of love um, and not words. So that's my experience with stage four. Um, when we get into stage five, I think this is probably the last stage that I have personal experience with. Um, and I had mentioned in a previous video, kind of that tunnel experience that I had. Um, it's an experience that's very difficult to put into words and maybe tunnel isn't the quite, quite the right word because there's not directionality to it. Um, I was speaking with my husband trying to nail down the best way to describe this and he decided that maybe the way that made the best sense is it feels like going into a safe, maybe. Um, 
but basically Teresa of Avila describes it as it's like the soul becomes unconscious to the body. Um, so at this point, whereas in the fourth stage, you're very aware of everything going on around you, you just don't really care or want much to do with it. In the fourth stage, you're not aware of what's going on around you. It's like you've left the exterior and gone to some interior hidden place where the world doesn't exist. Um, and then one of the things that Teresa of Avila um, describes this stage as, um, she says, quote, God implants himself in the interior of the soul in such a way that when it returns to itself, it cannot possibly doubt that God has been in it and that it has been in God. So firmly does this truth remain within it that although for years God may never grant it that favor again, it can never forget it or doubt that it has received it. This certainty of the soul is very material. And so I think probably my first experience with this was during the COVID lockdowns. And since then, I've experienced it three, maybe four times, um, not terribly often. It kind of catches me by surprise when it happens, but it's basically, it's the sensation spiritually, like I said, of being in a safe and that there are these really thick walls separating you from the world. And it seems a bit like a void, but usually when I'm having this experience, God is present in the void and is showing me something. And when this is happening, it's not a matter of a locution where you hear something audibly or it's not a vision. Um, I would describe it more along the lines of an understanding being planted really deep in my consciousness. So it's not like I'm being given a message. It's just like a seed of understanding has been planted. And then as that comes to flower, my mind will formulate a bit of a visual to represent to myself what I'm understanding, but it's not that I'm getting a vision, if that makes sense. It's just, it's just understanding and it's a very bizarre experience, but it's also a, there's a lot of love there. Um, it's, not, it's a place you don't want to leave. And it feels that if you were to leave, you would have to be very actively torn out of it. Um, so yeah, that is my experience with the fifth step. Um, so Teresa of Avila calls the fourth and the fifth steps um, illuminative. And then she calls the sixth and the seventh steps unitive. So I have not had any personal experience with the sixth and the seventh steps. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through just her description of the sixth and the seventh steps. And then in um, the following week's episode, when I come more from the St. John of the Cross perspective, he does a lot with the sixth step, which he calls the dark night of the spirit. Um, so I'll get a little bit more in depth with that, but basically the sixth step is a period of great suffering and trial. Um, but that suffering and trial is also balanced with some really profound mystical experiences. And so this is the stage that you get into with some of the really great saints where they have these really crazy experiences. So experiences such as locutions, visions, raptures, ecstasies, a tearful desire to be taken out of this earthly exile, flights of spirit, jubilations, the soul is consumed with desire for God. There's a profound aridity. So it's it's this weird balance. I From the descriptions of John of the Cross, which we'll talk about next week, it seems like this stage is marked more with suffering and aridity, even to the point of uh, physical ailments, like you are experiencing such spiritual suffering that it manifests physically. Um, but you're also kind of encouraged along by these periodic, highly mystical experiences. 
Um, Teresa of Avila says it's comparable only with the tortures of hell and that it's important even when you're experiencing this profound sorrow, this profound depression, this suffering um, that that's then balanced with these wild experiences that you are assured of the presence of God, that you still need to practice meditation, interestingly, because meditation is not mystical prayer, uh, but she says that when you're in this stage, you need to practice meditation to keep yourself grounded in reality. Um, so that's interesting to see even these saints who are having these otherworldly experiences that maybe a lot of people would look at and say these people have lost their minds, they're crazy, that they have this self-awareness to say, A, they, there's danger to be found in this, um, so you have to tread very lightly and with caution, which we'll talk more about next week, um, but also it's really important to keep yourself grounded in reality, and so that's where she encourages meditation. Um, and then the seventh step she calls mystical marriage, and also a second heaven. So, sounds pretty good. Um, she says, the soul is brought into this mansion by means of an intellectual vision where the most holy trinity reveals itself in all three persons. Here, all three persons communicate, to them, communicate themselves to the soul and speak to the soul. And she says that the effects of this mystical marriage are self-forgetfulness, which is so complete, that it really seems as though, as though the soul no longer existed. Uh, a great desire to suffer for the love of God. Um, and this is a time where once you get through that sixth stage and in, this, in the seventh stage, there's no more suffering. Well, I won't say there's no more suffering. There's no more periods of aridity. And there is a sense of the constant presence of God. So as in the fourth stage where I say I will occasionally feel the presence of God come to sit with me, I can only imagine in the seventh stage having something like that constantly. Um, that, that would change how you live, um, to have your heart and your consciousness and awareness always turn towards God because you're aware he's there. That's clearly the stuff saints are made out of. Um, to be able to live with that level of awareness of God 24-7. Um, so at this point, this, these saints still suffer, but there's, it's not the same experience. It's like you suffer in love. There's not as much, um, you don't lose your peace over your suffering because you have God's love with you and you know that not only is any suffering worth it, but suffering is also the way that you can demonstrate your love to God. So this is where you see the saints that um, cry out to God asking for suffering. And they say, I love my cross because they realize that this is their way that they can show God their love. Um, so yeah, that is all I really wanna to cover today with the seven um, steps to union with God, according to the steps set out by St. Teresa of Avila. Um, so like I said, next week, I wanna cover it more from John's perspective. Um, he's a poet and he focuses more on some transition moments and what that looks like. Um, so it also gives an opportunity to fill in any blanks with any questions you guys might have, because I know this is a lot, and if you ever try to just read these works, as I read them, even the first time, I didn't feel I totally understood, and it wasn't until I started to have some of these experiences that I started to be like, oh, that's what they're talking about. Um, so I know I wanted to put this in a form that was a little bit more relatable and understandable to the average person, because these things are really lofty and really mysterious. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the comments. If it's not something I can answer quickly, I can always incorporate it into next week's video. So thanks guys.